Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Nordenberg. I'm the former chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh and have the privilege of currently serving both as the chair of its Institute of Politics and director of its Dick Thornburg Forum for Law and Public Policy. Uh, the forum is named for and celebrates the legacy of an extraordinary leader, Dick Thornburg, who was a graduate of our School of Law uh, and who also served as a two-term governor of Pennsylvania, the United States Attorney General under two different presidents uh, and Undersecretary General of the United Nations. This evening's program is a part of the Preserving Democracy series of remote presentations that was launched by the Thornburg Forum uh, when pandemic protocols made large aud audience gatherings impossible. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight, not only on behalf of the forum, but also on behalf of the Institute of Politics and the Pitt Institute of Cyber Law Policy and Security, both of which are serving as co-sponsors this evening. Let me also extend that welcome more personally on behalf of Samantha Balbier, the director of the Institute of Politics, and David Hickton, the founding director of the Cyber Institute. In fact, we have plucked this evening's special guest uh, from within the Cyber Institute, as well as from the Department of Political Science. He is Michael Colarisi, uh, the William S. Dietrich the second chair of political science at Pitt and also the research and academic director of the Pitt Cyber Institute. He is a distinguished scholar whose work is widely respected and whose areas of expertise include disinformation, misinformation and extremism and national security and espionage. He spent the earlier years of his career at Michigan State until he was recruited to the University of Pittsburgh to become the inaugural holder of the Dietrich chair. In a very real sense, then, we would not be here tonight with Michael, uh, except for the business successes, investment acumen, and extraordinary generosity of the late Bill Dietrich. So I want to take just a moment to acknowledge him. Bill first took the business that had been founded by his father and grew it into the country's largest manufacturer of light metal framing for the construction industry. Then as he prepared to sell the company, he donated all of his stock in it to a charitable trust with the intent to create a foundation that would benefit uh, select institutions of higher education, as well as certain cultural and civic organizations, principally in Western Pennsylvania. He then launched a second career, assuming principal responsibility for investing those assets in ways that increase their value many times over, a responsibility that subsequently was ably assumed by the team he recruited uh, before his death uh, some 11 years ago. Bill earned his undergraduate degree from Princeton and while he was serving as the CEO of his company, went back to school, uh, earning both a master's degree and a PhD from Pitt. He also was a longtime member of our board of trustees, serving as its chair for several years. Because he had earned his graduate degrees at Pitt in political science, 
We felt that the most important first investment of the funds we received from the Dietrich Foundation uh, was to endow a chair in political science. Uh, that is the chair now held by our distinguished guest. Uh, the thing we need to uh, gratefully remember is that Bill Dietrich not only gave away and continues to give through his foundation uh, an extraordinary amount of money, uh, but he gave almost all of it away. Uh, in that sense, he was a strong believer in the words written by Andrew Carnegie, who said that the man who dies rich dies disgraced. Bill, we all are extremely grateful to you. Uh, with that, let me turn to the uh, distinguished academic who holds the Dietrich chair. Uh, and this evening's topic, which is disinformation, disruption, and the destabilization of democracies. Uh, Michael, you are the academic and research director of Pitt's Cyber Institute, uh, and you direct the Cyber Institute's disinformation lab. Uh, one of the first sentences on the lab's homepage broadly declares that disinformation threatens our health, undercuts our security, and undermines our democracy. Uh, and looking at what's being written today, there are a lot of people who agree with you, uh, but it appears that not everyone is convinced, uh, including some of our registrants who uh, might be inclined to say, these are the kind of statements that have been made every time a faster tool for communication emerges, and that in fact, you could go back to the development of the printing press and uh, find statements made by people then that are similar. But you are the director of the disinformation lab. I assume you stand by that statement. Uh, so what makes the threats posed by the disinformation today uh, so serious and so different? Thanks so much. Before I begin, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to have this conversation today. I want to thank the staff, um, you know, for, for setting this up and the participants and, uh, you know, the audience members here uh, for, for a conversation about this. And this is all worth talking about, I think, because there is disagreement, you know, about it. And I think when we get down to the nitty gritty of sort of what democracy is and the title of, uh, you know, tonight's conversation, you know, democracy is about problem solving. Um, democracy is about consent for solutions among the public and, you know, how we build those things. And I think when we focus on problem solving and the consent that is necessarily from the public and a democracy, we can see sort of two things that are, that are different. This doesn't mean that disinformation is new, that lying is new, um, you know, that, that people that want to sow anxiety or disrupt the functioning of democracies is new. I don't think, I think there are many parts of the system of information communication technology that we're living in right now that are, are very old and understanding of those can help us. But there are a couple, I think, new elements that in any system, like when you change a part, right, you can, you can break it, um, you can have it spit out things in the wrong direction, um, or it can start a fire. Um, and so I would say two, the two of the things that are, are different is one is just the access that the digital and computational revolutions that are now living within the social media platforms that we see have allowed access to millions of eyeballs and democracies like from, and I think it's easiest to see sort of external rivals. So thinking about you know, Russia, Chinese government, Iran, um, but you can also think about um, extremists that there are now technology to reach millions of people in ways that we know from declassified documents, for example, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union would have loved to have been able to do and tried to do in different ways, but it was hard. It was difficult because access to eyeballs had to go through newspapers, broadcasts. There were gatekeepers of like, maybe we'll get into sort of analog versus digital differences, you know, but the, the printing, they were, they were sort of choke points um, that were regulated with gatekeepers. And it was difficult if you didn't capture those gates 
to get in front of lots and lots of eyeballs, it's easy now. Um, you know, to to buzz messages around digitally and get into people's brains and their visual cortexes. That's one. But second, and I think most nefarious, right, is the idea. What's new is what I call data valence. You might have heard of it as surveillance capitalism. It's the idea that that we're not just users of social media and the internet. We're used by it. Data is collected and processed, and that there is a large industry that is designed in which to categorize us. And that information can be used to narrow cast, not broadcast, but narrow cast messages, right, to particular segments, right? And those messages aren't like previous messages, like looking at a tree or, right, seeing if there is an invading army coming down towards, uh, you know, DC off the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but they can, we can all see sort of different versions of something because the person and the people that control the code and have access to our prior beliefs can show us things that will be potentially uh, persuasive, right, to us in ways that they want to be persuasive. And so the digital trace data that makes much of like the computational social science world that I live in, it makes researchers incredibly excited because there's parts of society that social scientists can dig into, right? And we can see and test theories on that stuff, but there's a dark side to that about the influence of people and the lack of independence of the information that's put in front of people and their prior beliefs and biases. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> trends of course are so important. Uh, and I smiled over the weekend when I read a report that was issued by the uh, Pew Research Center over the weekend. Uh, it was issued about five years ago, and it said uh, the experts are almost evenly split uh, about whether the next decade is going to uh, bring a reduction in false and misleading narratives online or whether there will be uh, an increase. Uh, again, we're just about at the midpoint of that coming decade to which that uh, publication referred. What are the trend lines? Is it getting worse or is it getting better? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And you know, definitely different people you would have sitting in this chair might give you, you know, different answers. And I would, and you should, you should know that I'm, I'm relatively pessimistic. I think relative to a lot of political scientists. So some people would say we're doing okay. The heterogeneity of information that's out there is much broader than it was decades ago. Um, in the points of view that we can ac have access to, and you know, that's a point for the better. And when we look at parts of the system, and I would like to see, think about sort of our communication, our learning about the world as a system, um, there are parts that are great, that are trend lines in the right direction. So if you're looking at nextdoor.com in Squirrel Hill, and you found a bug, and you post what that bug is, you will get awesome expert advice on what that bug is that you couldn't have gotten before, right? And that is that is all for the good. And we can find nooks and crannies of these of, in the information system that we live in where there are things that are possible and great. And I don't want to gloss over those, but I do want us to also be able to zoom out and not just see systems in sort of our local um, lives or even in just the United States or even across democracies. I really think it's important for us to focus on, given sort of machine learning, artificial intelligence, the digital and computational revolutions in social media, I think we need to look very broadly about when we talk about winners and losers, we need to compare autocratic uses of, for example, machine learning technology. So systems of control rather than systems of consent um, you know, of, of the public. And I think many of the tasks doesn't have to be true of machine learning and artificial intelligence um, you know, uh, created from data valence and active surveillance. But it is the case currently that these technologies are incredibly useful for autocracies um, to remain in control and disrupt uh, people that would want to get in the way of their power. Um, they're not as useful currently right now. And I think they are less useful than people thought they would be a decade ago at solving problems, at having people come and deliberate um, from different viewpoints and, you know, help uh, help them figure out what they have in common, how to compromise. I don't think anyone looks at Twitter and says, that's an engine of cooperation. I think they look at it as an engine of outrage. Um, and, you know, I think some people thought that was going to be a problem. And I, th I think I think it has been. Um, and I think it's something that we really need to focus on the why and how we get back um, some of the, the potential problem solving. Well, the, uh, uh, the pessimistic uh, group 
uh, in the Pew report was described as people who uh, believed that uh, uh, the dark side of human nature is aided more than stifled by technology. Are you putting yourself in that group? I, I don't. I, um, I, do I put myself in that group? It's, it's definitely part of it. Right. But I actually don't see it as a dark side. I just see it as a human side. You know, like one of the amazing things is about humans is that, you know, we can make sense of the world together. Right. Like we know from neuroscience that we only see this small disk of our perceptions, you know, that we're rotating. We're constantly imputing what's going on and we'll be able to communicate about, uh, you know, what's out there in the world that we can figure out policies, that we can create vaccines, you know, that there's, there's these great things we can do together with actually relatively limited information um, in, in the ability to, to sort of do it and, and talk about that. And so, but those same biases and assumptions that get us that power, right, despite the limited input can be used against us. Um, and so, you know, there are dark motives, right, and incentives out there, for example, incentives to disrupt rather than persuade. And I do think a lot of even the framing of that question and a thought people sort of had in the mindset that we were in a world where in democracy, it's a battle of persuasion. And what we need to do is just honestly talk about our different sides and try to persuade the other side. And one of the things that's different when we have this opening up of eyeballs and you know, to outside intervention is that you have people participating in conversations, in fact, possibly being the loudest and most powerful voices in the conversation, that only benefit if they disrupt the conversation, um, that they get in the way of the problem solving. And that shifts all sorts of assumptions about what works and what doesn't work in the marketplace of ideas. And you know, is that the dark side of human nature or are there's the dark motives right, of competition you know, that exist? Um, that's kind of how I would put it. Having looked at the uh, list of registrants, I know that there are true experts in the audience tonight. Uh, I also suspect that there may be an even larger number of people like me who uh, struggle to deserve the label technologically literate. Uh, and so you said a little bit ago, well, maybe we would talk about some of these terms so they don't get in our way as we move forward. So can you talk about some of the terms that uh, are uh, critical, the analog versus digital and misinformation versus disinformation and uh, the term that you just used, data valence. Sure. So maybe I'll just start like definitionally, you know, in, in, in academia and in, in journalism, there, we try to draw a line um, between disinformation and misinformation, where disinformation is, you can think about it, a message right, that has content that it was designed to intentionally mislead. Um, and so it's trying to update someone's beliefs in their head, reading that message and move them away from a place where a useful message might've moved them in a different direction, um, you know, had they read it or keep them in a place that is not particularly useful. Misinformation, there are messages that might contain misleading information, but it's not intentional. Um, and, and, you know, that can be a very academic, uh, you know, in which given this forum, you know, we should try to move beyond that. Um, you know, that, that can be a very academic distinction because you have to get at intentions, right, to define the difference between them. And often what we see is the message, right? That's what we see. And we might have in different interpretations of that. And, you know, one of the things I think to focus on is, you know, disinformation, misinformation, there's malinformation, which is something that's true, but misleads in context because of omission and commission. Um, but all of these terms are about like how we problem solve. Right. And that's like not for anyone to get lost in like the terminology. Right. But but the idea is we're trying to figure out the world. We're trying to infer what's going on. And it's not easy. It's never been easy um, in, as, as citizens. Right. To do this. Um, and, you know, one way to think about it is disinformers. Right. People that have incentives to create disinformation campaigns intentionally, um, you know, can can have disruptive consequences for that difficult task. But in the system overall, right, it's not just there is disinformation or misinformation, right, or good information, right, or bad. There's various shades of useful or not and uncertainty. And there's mis and disinformation circulating together, right, in a system. And it's often, a, it's a very complex story. So we like to have these very clean terms to define corners of it. 
Um, and that's, that's, you know, so we can set those terms, but they circulate and cycle, you know, in, in absolutely complicated ways. Part of that complication gets at the difference between sort of what I call the analog platforms versus digital platforms. So analog, I think I still read the newspaper on a Sunday morning and make my kids read it too, right? And so the newspaper, like in paper form, it's analog. It has a continuously varying medium, right? In which the messages are transmitted, right? So it's not binary bits, one, zero, that's digital, right? That are coursing through processors and storage, right? With like electrons going through. Um, right, but they're continuously varying media. And so like radio waves can do this. Um, me clicking on my computer is an analog movement, right? But what happens inside the computer, right, is, is largely digital. And I guess one of the reasons I draw this distinction between analog and digital, and I hope we can touch on it a couple of times, is I really do believe that democratic citizenship was greatly aided by analog platforms that we could all see and react to that sent kind of a broadcast signal, um, you know, that was that was there and could be passed around. That analog, in some some sense, analog takes effort to create, an effort to propagate, and uh, you know we've evolved a similar way. Even though we all have very very different brains, right? Um, we we can sort of see and talk about those common signals, right? The digital is different. The rules are the rules about what's possible is different. And digital is like magic, right? I can move things around the world, right? At almost light speed, right? Which is impossible in the sort of analog world. And it does tricky things, right? With our senses, with our norms, with our way of thinking about truth and usefulness and social proof and what's there. We see this, for example, like we, like our local newspaper should represent our community. And we're sort of, you know, if you grew up with local newspapers, we have that affinity right, for that. And newspapers moved online. And so you might see something that looks like a local newspaper, but it doesn't have to be. It could have created by someone in Indonesia, right, for a specific point. And so what happens is, right, we sort of blend over uh, heuristics, right, sort of things, shortcuts that used to help us that can be exploited now. And so sort of, I think, understand the availability of that exploitation in the digital world, and the difficulty of it in the analog world, well, it may give us some leverage, right, of thinking through these things. And maybe the strongest reason to do that is because of data valence. Data valence, I don't think, would be possible in a purely analog world. The digital trace data we leave when we, when we go to a website, you know, when we, we type in, right, something into a search bar, you might think that if you don't press return, they never see it, but they do. Um, they, they see what you're typing, a click, right, triggers a digital reaction um, on the other end. Just being on one like website doesn't mean that other, other data brokers and others aren't seeing you and what you're doing. Um, and so the idea of data valence is, you know, the surveillance of your actions um, in digital trace data, you know, that we're leaving and that's happening across devices. So it's phones, it's your car, if it has GPS. Um, it's your online behavior and the way those things are woven together and, and processed. I don't call it surveillance capitalism, which some people do because it extends beyond companies and capitalism and involves politics, both domestic and international. You know, that was a great explanation, uh, but I'm really a student of writing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so if you don't mind, I'd like to read just for a moment uh, the way you describe this in your one of your most recent articles, because I thought that it was so well done. Uh, and it, it relates to this notion uh, that without calling the term browser disinformation or misinformation, you said it creates the wrong impression uh, because it leaves you with the sense that you're the one doing the browsing. Uh, when on the other hand, it's other people who are browsing you. Uh, and here's part of what you said. When you type in a web address, this is an explicit invitation for someone else. The server is less like a waiter and more like a person delivering a warrant uh, into your own computer. You are not going into their house. They're coming into yours and they're bringing a video recorder. Uh, and then you go on to say, even further, 
this surprising guest did not come alone. Uh, whenever you invite a web page into your computer that has a relationship with a company such as Google, Facebook, Twitter, or another network, they all are coming over too, and they're bringing their own equipment. Uh, and then you make the point that you don't know when they leave. Uh, they may still be there long after you clicked on that New York Times uh, web page and thought that's what you were having a relationship with. So again, can you give a broad sense of the ways in which uh, this information that is extracted through data valence is used? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for, for, for reading that. Um, I do think part of our, as citizens, our disadvantage is that we're on one side of a screen, but all the action happens on the other side of the screen and even far away, potentially like on servers, right? Uh, with the processing of that information. Um, and so yeah, I do think it's not just analogies. It's actually our understanding of what's going on and our role, what is our role um, in the information system. Um, and we think of ourselves as users, you know, but we're being, but we're being used. So, you know, what happens is, you know, you go to a website and, you know, uh, these uh, programs come onto your computer. They're there and they leave marks, which you can think of on, on your walls and your house. Um, we call these cookies, um, but there's, there's other tracking devices too that they use. Um, they record what's going on. They talk to each other and, you know, they record what they've done and then who you are, what they see. So where you've been, who else made marks on your walls, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and then again, like, so this is where the analog, so I want to have better analog metaphors. Like our house is an analog thing. But in digital, right, these programs can be in a million different places all at once, right? Which is not true for like a person if we embody them. But in the digital world, that's fine, right? They can copy all of that information. They can have a digital scan of your house and all the marks on it and everything. And you don't know sort of any of that. So how is that used? So what happens is this data is collected um, in both large corporations and by data brokers, and then it's exchanged um, and it's not that like everyone, you know, what you basically need is a supercomputer to crunch and decide whether you're going to sell me a Pearl Jam teacher or something because I'm Gen, Gen X and like that would persuade me. Um, you know, really what we're, we are is segmented, you know, and depending on who you're talking to, it's about 50 or 250 segments in the United States um, based on sort of where you live, your demographic characteristics, what they think you like right, your behavior, you know, part of the research on data valence is that we're not as unique as we think we are, um, that we, there are types of us um, in how we can be um, in, in our biases, in kind of how we think about the world, um, the ways that we can uh, be distracted um, or how our attention can be manipulated in certain ways. Um, and so people buy access to that data. So that's one, right, is they just sort of use that and then they can target us with ads. Right? There's nothing to stop, for example, the Russian government for buying this information and then not using it on the ad platform, but using it for like accounts right? and bots um, to, to, to target and, and boost messages. So those are, those are two ways. But there's also another way that's even like easier that can be used in addition to these things, which is just experimentation. Right? Part of data valence is the ability to see what messages are working and what's not. So this doesn't have to run like some sort of scientific lab where there's a hypothesis and a test. And if the test doesn't work, then the, you know, the, the internet research agency in Russia loses. No, they can keep trying. It's, it's much more you know, like a slot machine right? with odds that you know, they just sort of have to figure out where to play and, and to win. And they've, they've got a lot of money because it's super duper cheap to play. So they can watch what messages in which of these segments play, which ones get attention, which ones work. Right? And then they can leverage and borrow strength both across countries, across communities, um, you know, about what does, and they can experiment very cheaply and very quickly because of performance metrics, right? That are also part of debate balance about what you click on and, and other things. And so that's another way that it's used. And it's sort of, it's not either or, right? These things all happen together. Can, can we get a little bit more concrete and, and go back to the disinformation lab statement that uh, disinformation uh, is being used to hurt our health, 
to uh, undercut our security and to undermine our democracy. Can you give some examples in one or more of those categories? Sure. Um, so I think we can start with COVID. Um, there are part of sort of technologist excitement, you know, about progress that maybe was in that Pew survey like 10 years ago and, and still exists is that we have these technical solutions like vaccines, um, you know, like treatments for COVID. But what we've also seen is that people have to trust them. People have to provide, consent isn't just about voting. Consent is about providing the resources of your participation in society, right, in ways that, you know, you think are going to be beneficial. And so the, vac the lower vaccination rate in the United States relative to other democracies, but like in many democracies, it's not just the United States, there's a lower vaccination rate than I think a lot, all, you know, nearly all public health experts would tell you, like would be optimal for saving lives, right? Literally people are dying because they've been targeted in part by messages given their demographic, right? About like what will make them anxious what will make them uneasy about doing it? Are you pregnant? Well, you know, maybe you should think about how many pregnant women do you think were actually in the study, right? Um, you know, these kinds of things, um, you know, that are said that when you know something about someone, you can target them, right, with particular messages to make them uneasy. And then you can also do things like there's social effects to this, that if other people aren't getting vaccinated, you can get the ball rolling in the wrong direction. Um, and I think we've seen this on COVID just in a, in a number of different directions. And I would say like, you can think about those as sort of first order effects, right? Sort of direct effects on people's behavior that can have harmful con consequences. When we get to sort of democracy, right? As apart from public health, what I worry about the most are the second order effects. What I worry about the most is the ease at getting people to distrust, right? Expertise, right? Uh, public servants, particularly people that aren't like them, that might, they might not have um, sort of analog experience with and bonds of trust, um, that there are digital representations at a distance that can be distorted in, in what we see. And I think in the rising distrust we see um, you know, across myriad, that concerns me greatly on the democratic side. So the targeting of you shouldn't listen to the news, right? You shouldn't listen to this group of people and that might be public health, right? But it, but it also just could be solutions to gerrymandering um, and solutions to, you know, drawing districts that are going to help support our democracy. It might be, you know, discussions of who won the election and who should you trust, right, to call, um, to call an election. And so those, those second order effects, I think are, I think they're really, really important. Um, and they sort of get at the erosion of trust. And again, it's not simply just um, domestically. There's an erosion of trust internationally, um, you know, in, uh, can NATO do its job, right, moving forward um, in, in Europe? And I really do think, you know, one thing to consider is this balance between autocracies and democracies, right? And democracies need to depend on each other. They need to be functional um, both within each country, but they need to be able to cooperate um, also. And we've been able to do that in the past, you know, sufficiently um, to have, I think, real successes. Um, but whether that continues, given the nuances um, of sort of, you know, the changes I laid out about social media today and disinformation, I think there's, there's concern about that. And mainly those are around those second order effects about who trusts who, um, you know, what networks are being built, you know, who are we depending on to understand the world? Do we know uh, whether the uh, bulk of the disinformation that is targeting public health security, democracy, uh, is from a domestic source or a foreign source, or is it just coming from everywhere? Yeah, so I, I definitely uh, think it's both. Um, and also, this is one of these places where I think like our analog analogies, they even break down like bulk. Uh, you know, so we could think about like the number of messages right, as, as, as bulk. And in that case, there's more domestic messages, right, um, being propagated than international messages. And a lot of people take that as a really positive sign that international influence campaigns, well, there's such a small proportion of the total messages that we see on a given platform, you know, what's the big deal? But I think about bulk as in our sort of probability distributions in our head of who to trust and who not to trust, 
Um, I think that's where the messages actually hit the road. And in that case, when it's when it's algorithmically boosted signals of disinformation, when what Russia does is not just not have to send lots of messages, but what they do is they create networks like Kathleen Carley at CMU's work has been able to show. They engineer networks to boost signals so more people see them. Same message, more influence. Um, and so if you just count messages, you might say it's not that big of a deal internationally, but the way they're able to create um, influence across social media networks and across platforms that quite frankly are sometimes very difficult to detect because they're narrow cast, because someone might be looking at public messages, but they're happening on private message boards. They might be looking on uh, you know, some specific private groups, but this is happening on ads, which they're not looking for. And so the lack of transparency on some of this is definitely a problem in getting a, a sense of, of, of that bulk. But I would definitely say it's both. That this is a system. Um, and in some sense, it's like very natural. The domestic side, we should have disagreements, right? There should be people that you know, don't know the most useful set of policies across everything it would take to be a citizen, particularly when we think about COVID like, or you know, complicated um, issues like how much support should we send to Ukraine, right? These are really complicated, difficult issues. We should have disagreements about that. Um, and some of that will be misinformation. Some of it will be sharing things that sort of aren't useful or true. And that is totally fine and absolutely part of healthy democratic discussion and debate. But once we start in entering the dis disruptive incentives, the manipulation you know, of what people see and the influence, right? It's that system of the mix of mis and disinformation where you see the misinformation that's out there sort of naturally, you can boost that if you're a disinformer, right? If you're an extremist group that only wants to see the system burn, doesn't want to solve the problem, right, particularly. Um, and so I think it's the interface between these things, sort of honest diversity of thought, right, that can be weaponized, pulling people apart, caricaturing the other side, not finding that common ground, but, you know, sort of the, the differences that are there, um, that in the system is, is, is huge. And so the bulk of my concern, right, is about the both and how they interface, particularly with data valence. So that in a country in which freedom of speech is enshrined in the constitution, uh, the traditional response would be uh, that the best way to deal with uh, false information is true information. Mm -hmm. uh, the best way to deal with uh, misleading uh, statements is to put out accurate statements. But what you're saying is that the uh, notion that a rebuttal uh, is an adequate response to what we're experiencing now just isn't right. Yeah. So I think those are those are analog rules for you know a society that had informational sovereignty that. You know, you have a group of citizens that are trying to solve some shared problem, but have super different ideas about what is the best policy to do that. I think rebuttal, argumentation, what evidence can you bring to bear? In, we're here, right, talking on an amazing set of technology, right, because that has worked, right? Um, and so, so that, it's not that I'm saying that doesn't work, but the digital rules are different. And let me explain why Right? That doesn't work when you're faced with someone who's not interested in persuasion. They're interested in disruption. Right? So if we're trying to find new solutions to an to a emerging problem, so again, COVID, I think, is a good example where we have changes in behavior. People don't already have the right answer. Right? They're figuring out about the world about what's best. Um, if you have someone who just wants to disrupt, well, what do they have at their disposal digitally? Thousands, hundreds of thousands of messages can be cheaply created. And there are literally warehouses, or they don't even have to have them in one place, right? There are what we think of as troll farms, but there's influence campaign markets that exist, particularly in developing world, where there's ethnographies of these things about, you know, there's a specialization that goes into where you pay people to develop messages for specific targeted audiences, to design accounts, they have packs of SIM cards, right, so that they're, they're putting into different phones and accounts. And what you can do is create all of these messages. So now if our strategy is rebut, right, we're rebutting thousands of different inauthentic arguments. We're spending all of our time and resources consciously thinking, not automated, right? We don't necessarily have 
right? A, uh, a huge farm of people, right? To go, to go do this work. Um, you know, uh, I know, I know scientists in particular, like experts, right? Are very challenged, right? At, you know, we have this scientific language in order to discover a fact, but how do we get it out there? Creating a lie is super easy. And once you know people's prejudices, right? You can sort of target that lie in any direction that you think is going to be effective. And data valence, you can measure whether it's working or not. With science, like you're anchored at the truth, like, or you're anchored at like your useful knowledge that you have. That's how it's supposed to work, right? So now you have to go work on what's going to be the persuasive rebuttal to all of these different systems, right? You didn't inauthentically create networks to boost your signal, given the algorithmic rules of the time, because you ain't cheating, right? So everything's tilted against you. And you have all of these vectors of inauthentic um, uh, misinformation and disinformation uh, targeted at specific people. So you have no time, right? Even if you sort of did all of that successfully, all you did was keep people where they were. You didn't necessarily get them the new information to get them where they need to like be, possibly to make an informed decision as a citizen and give their consent. Um, and I just think that's different. Those digital rules, um, you know, really tilt tilt the playing field in, in the, at least in the technologies we have right now, um, you know, towards that disruption. And so our, our ideas of persuasion that are embedded in our belief and our trust in free speech, right, in rebuttal, in, in, um, in thinking about an open marketplace of ideas where like, you know, the truth or at least the most useful ideas should went out, they depend on a set of assumptions that I think worked really, really well in kind of analog worlds with informational sovereignty, where you had citizens, right, with some common cause and common problems they're trying to figure out. I think when you shift the participants in that to not necessarily sharing, wanting to solve the problem at all, um, and the sort of inauthentic behavior that's possible with narrowcasting, right? It's a it's a different ball game, and we got to figure out, you know, how we can prop solve problems together, right, in the world we're living in. So recognizing that. Uh... The opportunity to rebut uh, is not going to be enough. Uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security a couple of weeks ago uh, announced that there was going to be a disinformation governance board, which immediately prompted a huge backlash. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so, so I do think, you know, one thing that in democracies we have been rightfully concerned about is information control by the government. And we should, because democracy functions based on public consent, informed public consent, a public that's trying to problem solve to be functional, but public consent. If the government controlled the information that we see and, you know, decided what they wanted us to see and not see, well, that looks a lot like autocracy. Right, which is a system of information and control, um, you know, that's sort of top down, not bottom up, either by compellence or deterrence. Um, and so, I think people are absolutely right to be thinking about, you know, these trade offs. Um, and it, and in particular, like many of what I've been talking about are how people can solve problems, you know, and this is social groups, um, you know, not necessarily government. So now we need to talk about like the government's role in this. And I think there is concern that when we use the words disinformation from the government, you know, that that means censorship. That means potential physical, right, censure, financial censure for specific points of view that can have extremely deleterious effects on problem solving, given that the diversity of, you know, opinions, you know, diversity of perspectives are crucial for solving the complex problems we're facing. So I think I understand why people are concerned, you know, about the Department of Homeland Security, right, setting this up. On the other hand, right, when you get past the title and you read sort of what they were trying to do, you know, they're concerned about sort of false rumors that people are falling for. Um, and they went to, I think, you know, people that have studied these, these false rumors and their influence um, to start looking into that. You know, so we have a long history of the government trying to provide, for example, public service announcements. Um, that one role the government can play is investing in the, the vegetables of our information diet of what we, what we need, both in like literally the nutrition information on the side of a box, 
um, you know, to, you know, what to do in the event of uh, a foreign attack or, you know, something, something of that scale and magnitude. Um, and so I think Chris Krebs gets this right when he says that the rollout, you know, was done sort of very hastily, it seems in some ways, you know, that he can understand why people are on edge, you know, about, um, about the naming and a, a lot of groundwork needed to be done to make sure there were a heterogeneity of voices on the panel themselves that were trusted by different nooks and crannies, right, across um, the spectrum in America. But um, that the, the idea that the government wants to be able to rebut um, false information and not sort of have both hands tied behind their back, you know, when discussing these things, um, you know, that's not, that's not crazy either. And I, I think, you know, part of this is we have to balance risks um, that when we're talking about information, you know, there is absolutely risk and unfettered access to our eyeballs and manipulation. I just, I think it, it is, it is a potential risk, you know, with absolutely no regulation in our, in our digital world, but that doesn't mean that the risks of potential censorship um, that regulation, right, can bleed towards autocracy, that people are concerned about that, that, that they don't have something very valuable to contribute to the conversation too. Um, and so, you know, this, uh, there's a sort of fractal um, structure to this, right, where it's like a Jackson Pollock painting where we sort of have to solve our distrust, right, caused by mis and disinformation to actually have institutions to help us rebut mis and disinformation. But that's where we find ourselves. Um, like having having to do that work. And I, I think just announcing something top down, right, rather than growing it, you know, from concerned parties and finding sort of what's the shared, you know, vision for that um, across diverse perspectives is probably the way to go. Well, moving outside of the government, one of our registrants made reference to a recent article in The Atlantic by Jonathan Haidt, uh, who said uh, that what we needed were three reforms to social media to deal with disinformation. User verification, which would be similar to the know your customer uh, requirements that exist in the financial services industry. Open source algorithms so that uh, scholars and scientists would have access to them uh, and modifying the share function uh, so that there needed at least at some point in time to be a real person who was pushing things out. What do you think about those ideas? Yeah, so I think there's steps in the, in the right direction and they hint at why I think, they, they hint at the right direction, but that also I think we need to go further than these things. So two out of the three in particular, I think get at the idea that we need a little more analog, you know, in our thinking about social media. So number one, real people, right? We need to get rid of this idea that the cloud is somehow this glowing, pure, right, version of problem solving and communication. It's not, it's people. It's people communicating and we're analog and we're messy and we're biased. And there's all sorts of things that are happening, um, you know, up there. And so allowing someone to cheat um, and create inauthentic accounts, right, is potentially a problem. Um, so I do think like that realness, right, that analogness, is important. The third point is also, I think, gets at, right? Analog actions of propagation take time, right? They slow us down, right, in, in thinking. And so not just, right, having literally automated bots, right, that at the speed of a product, like electrons flowing through processors, hundreds at a time, thousands at a time, re-clicking something to make it seem like it's a huge deal. Um, you know, that's that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are tweeting at this is trending. So I see it on trending, but I also see it everywhere else, right? So it must be important, um, right? That sort of propagation is happening all the time without the friction, right? That comes from analog worlds of people who have to be thoughtful about the limited sort of uh, resources we have in the analog world about like what we do and, and how we expend both our, our time and our reach. Um, sometimes quite literally. So I think that is that is useful too, okay? And I also support open sourcing algorithms, although the techniques of that like have to be sorted out. It's, it's not super easy. Some people are worried about open sourcing helping the people I'm worried about with data valence, but I would say they're already doing that. They're already experimenting in exactly the way they want to, right? This allows non-cheaters, right, to try to learn uh, like what's happening, okay? 
I do think with the open source piece that we need to be very um, intentional about the incentives. So I'm, I'm a big believer in open source software and open data um, in sort of replication and science and transparency, but it doesn't always happen because they're not necessarily the incentives for people to do it. There's incentives for people to use algorithms for disruption because they're getting what they want. We have to create incentives for people from like diverse backgrounds and perspectives from Lafayette County, right? To, to Homewood, to people that can test out from their perspective, what will they see from this algorithm? Right, given there's you know almost the whole of human experience that can go in, right, and what comes out right from the algorithm is what we need to see, you know, for for these groups. Um, and so we need ways of diversifying and incentivizing the people that can access right that test it out, stress test it, and learn you know what what's going on. And then I would say the real parts I'm not, I'm not sure they're going far enough. Um, in, in that, I think we need to sort of get rid of the whole idea that social media is somehow different um, in uh, its propagation, um, in its accounts. It's, it's people talking, and that means that platforms need to be held responsible, um, you know, for if there are ill effects, right, from that distribution of information. And I think we also need to get past, you know, the sort of idea that, if, if someone says something that a, a, um, a social media company doesn't like, right? Then there's the question of, well, is that free speech, right? On that platform? Or like I would argue, or is it more like they invited you over to their house? Again, another analog um, metaphor for you. Um, they invited you over to your house. There's a big party. There's lots of people there, right? And you know, you're saying things that they're not super happy about. Don't they have the right to say like, mm, calm, maybe like calm down, maybe you should go outside and cool off a little bit, right? Or even to kick you out of their house. But in that case, it's because they're responsible, right? It's there, there's some ownership they have and responsibility for the platform. Um, and I, I think we need to get back to the people that are on the other side of the algorithms, the people that are on the other side of who gets an account and who doesn't and setting the rules. Just because the code and the bits are opaque to us, doesn't mean they're not incredibly meaningful, right? That's part of what I think is a little pernicious about the digital world. The code is creating the illusions on our screen, and then we're using these analog sort of ideas to understand them. But when you control the code, unlike when we look at a tree together, the tree isn't different, right? It's a little bit different for you and me, maybe, right? Like my glasses are probably more stronger than yours. But, you know, like we can talk about, we're getting the same signal. The tree isn't lying, right, in some sense. Right, the tree isn't showing me a side of it that I like and a side of you that you would like more. But coders, right, underneath the, our two different screens, even though we have the illusion of seeing the same platform or the thing, can show us different things based on our priors, right? And so we need to get to the people that are writing the code. We need more voices writing code and thinking about sort of what's underneath the hood of those things. So that's that's my reflection. It's it's a it's a really important essay that I think moves us in the right direction. Um, you know, on uh, on the reality of of what's going on online, but I think we need to we need to keep moving that debate forward. Is the new Digital Services Act uh, in the EU a, a step in the direction that you're describing? Yeah, yeah I, I do think I, I think it's a it's a step. I think GDPR, you know, was a step. The, the thing that I, I often hear about uh, sort of European regulations versus the U.S. on this is. So the European regulations actually, I think, do some really good things at curtailing data valence, at holding companies responsible for what is happening, like I'm saying, that it's, it's their platform. That's good. But they're often really, really bad at communicating why they're doing those things. And the, you know, I'm sure people are already getting the sense this is hard. Like this is a technical, really difficult world where I'm using words like code a lot and, and things. Um, and the regulations don't make it any easier. Uh, when we're when we're writing about that, and uh, so it's very important to have communication of why these things are valuable. You know what they're specifically doing. So why we, we would want, in a sense of problem solving for democracies, why it's useful to have social media companies be responsible, right, for like the potential harms that you know when there is a, a riot that breaks out because of an algorithmically boosted message on Facebook in India and Indonesia. Right. That, you know, that happens in a similar way to if they had published a newspaper, right, with those things on it and delivered it, you know, to those to those people. And so I think we need to think through those connections. I do think the European um, 
uh, groups drafting these things are focusing on data valence in a right way uh, and responsibility in a useful way. But there's, again, like, like the, uh, the, the CISA Disinformation Governance Board, there's pushback, I think, right, about sort of who's at the table and writing it, how will this be used? The very distrust of experts and authority can undercut you know, even, you know, what might be in uh, abstract or in, in some world where people did trust, you know, useful sets of legislation and regulation. And so we need to move beyond sort of just the right set of regulation, but it needs to be a conversation. We all need, I think, to understand better this information communication technology we're living in to sort of have informed opinions about, you know, how it, um, you know, how our value in free speech Right and and things can um, uh, can sort of be propelled through that. I want to take the last few minutes we have to uh, move us in a somewhat different direction. Uh, in the last two days, a New York Times columnist wrote an op-ed that was titled uh, "Putin Needs to Win the Information War in Ukraine." Uh, I won't ask you who's winning that war, but I do have two questions. Uh, the, the first is, how is it that Russia seems to have been so successful uh, in sealing off its own population uh, from information about what really is happening? Uh, and then the second is, why is it that Russia has not been successful uh, in seriously disrupting communications within Ukraine or from Ukraine to the outside world? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's re really important. It's a great question. And I think it dovetails into what we've been talking about a little bit. You know, Russia is on uh, the autocratic side where there's a lot of control that goes on. And so they are aided by the fact that people are on BK, that people are on social media where they can be surveilled. Um, and that creates fear. There's something uh, scholars of autocracy ca call preference falsification. It's not that necessarily people love like, the war, um, but they're, when they see other people or they see punishments, they can be reprimanded or worse imprisoned um, you know, for speaking out on something they're for or against, they won't do it. And so they'll appear to act in one way when they actually might be um, you know, thinking in, in another. There are holes in the, the Russian information curtain, um, but they're controllable. You know, people aren't necessarily acting on you know, the other information that they see. And that's partly because the priors that have been built up, that this is not an information war, information control story that started in April. This has been years and years in the making about people's narratives and worldview in Russia about the West, about NATO, um, about you know, what policies will serve their values. Um, and you know, that's been going on a long time. And so thinking you know, that uh, a set of signals from Ukraine are gonna be so strong right, as to overcome right, that narrative and those priors about Russia and the world um, and potential victimhood, um, you know, I, I think it's naive. Um, we all have these strong priors, and it's going to take a lot of discussion and communication um, that happens. And then when you add on the control and the fear um, that, you know, I really, there are these machine learning, um, you know, algorithms that they're able to use, right, to find out people that are likely to dissent and follow them, right, to infiltrate inauthentically, right, in these groups. And, and that all breaks down. It's disrupting, right? It's, it's effective disruption domestically, you know, for them. And so I, I, I think that's why they've been able to, to do that, because these technologies do benefit the control of, of autocrats um, currently. Now, why couldn't they do that right in, in Ukraine in, in the same way? So much of the signal communication technology that we're talking about isn't purely digital. There's lots of analog and digital signals that are being sent from Ukraine. Right. And there was resilience built in right to that information communication technology. And there's been investment from the outside. There's been coordination and cooperation across the democratic world to try to support that information, making it out. That doesn't mean there isn't disinformation and misinformation on the Ukrainian side, like with the ghost of Kiev and, and other things. Right. But it does mean there are authentic signals, often encoded digitally in what we see them right on the ground that can be convincing to us right about what's happened. 
there can be coordination, right? And not simply disruption on the ground on the part of the Ukrainian forces. And at the end of the day, right, the Ukrainian people were able to coordinate their values. I mean, they're making extraordinary sacrifices um, and, and not giving up, right? Because of what they believe in the narrative that they're fighting for, the problem, they are solving an enormous problem right now together, right? And they're doing it through communication and they're doing it through trust. And the stories that really resonate with me is how these local channels of communication of people who know each other and talk to each other, right? And how they've been able to help each other. I think that's actually something that we really need to focus on here in the US, that we need to stop thinking about the sort of computational telescopes in the cloud as being something that's not in our communities. And we need to have discussions right, in the real world as much as we can, right, sort of analog to digital, face to face as much as even if it's mediated like this, right, in diverse perspectives, open to listening, right, open to, you know, being wrong and, and shocked. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of that happens at the local level. Um, and a lot of misdisinformation research actually happens at the national, international level, right, instead of focusing on these local on the ground connections that I think have been incredibly valuable to Ukraine. And I think they're incredibly valuable and maybe one of our strongest points of resilience against mis and disinformation in the US today. Well, and what I would say is that this has been an incredibly valuable evening. Uh, the topic is one that is of uh, critical importance to all of us who do care about democracy and who care about the truth than it is comforting to know that uh, someone with your mind uh, and your heart uh, is devoting your time to this through the disinformation lab and your other work. So thanks for giving up a beautiful May evening in Pittsburgh to be in your office and to uh, communicate uh, about this topic with all of us. Thank you so much, Mark, and, and especially the participants and the people that helped plan this. I really enjoyed the conversation, and um, thank you. Well, we did too. So thanks, and good night, everyone.